Welcome to the League of Women Voters Tacoma Pierce County Primary Election Candidate Forum for Legislative District 31, Senate and House Position 1. I'm Lydia Zapetta, the moderator, and on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Tacoma Pierce County and our community sponsors, um, I welcome the candidates and the audience to this Community Candidate Forum. The League of Women Voters Tacoma Pierce County acknowledges that we gather on the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish peoples surrounded by their traditional waters in the shadow of Mount Tahoma. We actively seek inclusive and respectful partnerships that honor indigenous cultures, histories, identities, and current realities. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization whose mission for the past 100 years has been to empower informed and active participation of citizens in government. Candidate forums are one of the many ways that we do this Anyone 16 years or older can be a member of the League of Women Voters. For information on membership, go to our website, um, lwvtpc.org. That's lwvtpc.org. The candidates in ballot order are for Senate, Phil Fortunato, Clifford Knopic, and Chris Vance. For the House position one, Brandon, um, by none, Holly Stanton, and Drew Stokesbury. Phil Fortunato declined to participate. This year's primary election is August 2nd. If you're not yet registered or have moved, you may register or change your address online at votewa.gov. That's votewa.gov by July 25th. You should receive your ballot by July 18th if, you have a if you're a registered voter and if your address is correct. Your ballot must be postmarked or placed in a ballot drop box by 8 p.m. August 2nd. This forum is being recorded and will be posted on our website, um, lwvtpc.org. That's lwvtpc.org. Questions have been prepared by members of the League of Women Voters of Tacoma Pierce County and our co-sponsoring organizations. We invite live audience questions um, via text to 253-861-6824. That's 253-861-2684. Questions must be directed to all candidates and may be reworded or consolidated. Our timekeeper today is Terry Baker of the League of Women Voters to Come of Pierce County. She will hold up cards for the candidates to see when they know that when they have 60 seconds remaining, 30 seconds remaining, 15 seconds, and when it's time to stop. When you see the stop card, you may finish a short sentence. Please stay on gallery view so that you can see me and the timekeeper, Terry Baker. Please do not talk unless it's your turn. Please mute yourself when it's not your turn to speak. The audience is on mute and cannot use the chat function. A reminder that civility is expected. Um, you've all received a set of ground rules, which among other things include addressing the issues and not making personal attacks. Please confirm that you agree to the ground rules by giving me the thumbs up. Ah, thank you so much, I appreciate that. Um, each candidate has up to two minutes for an opening statement. After that, the order of questions will rotate and each candidate will be asked the same question. At the end, each candidate can have one, up to one minute for a closing statement. The order of the opening two minute statements is in ballot order. So we'll start with Clifford Knopic, then Chris Vance, then Brandon Bynum, then Holly Stanton, and then Drew Stokesberg. Clifford, please. Okay, can you hear me? Uh, yes. My name is Dr. Clifford Knopic. I have a doctorate in computer science as well as advanced degrees in Homeland Security, information systems, emergency management, and computer programming. Spent five years volunteering with the Washington State Guard for us training in response and preparedness. I'm running for senator because I do not feel representative of the Democrats or Republicans. I feel politically homeless. The politicians seem perfectly happy to abdicate their power to the governor under the state of emergency. Maybe the politicians don't understand the data and science and can't speak out against their misuse. I can and I will. I'm not beholden to special interest groups, so I can speak more freely than most. Public record requests show that the COVID injury broke. They did not stop transmission nor prevent hospitalization or death for many people. In fact, 
Her data shows boosted people are more likely to get COVID than not and unvaccinated. That the public health and politicians are obfuscating this information should be alarming to everyone. You'll hear our thoughts on a variety of topics tonight, but unless we end the state of emergency and all associated mandates fix the emergency law so future governors cannot exploit it, none of it matters. The king can rule the legislature at any time. I've been called an insignificant wannabe. I might be insignificant, but I'm not a wannabe. I don't want to be a king like Governor Inslee. I don't want to be a career politician. I don't want to be a person who misleads the, like the Department of Health. I will be a leader who will strive for more efficient, less intrusive government, and I'll be a leader who speaks to power, even if I'm the only one doing it. I look forward to your question tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chris Vance. Good evening. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for sponsoring this forum. My name is Chris Vance, and 30 years ago, I represented this district in the Washington State House of Representatives. This is where I've lived most of my adult life, where my wife Ann and I raised our kids. Um, then I went on to be a member of the King County Council and then the chairman of the Washington State Republican Party. I'm now running for the state Senate as a moderate independent because our politics have changed and not for the better. Partisanship, divisiveness, gridlock, uh, extremism is out of control in our political system. Both parties have let us down and voters deserve more choices. You know, our communities still face some very real challenges. Our schools are still far too dependent on local levies, which means that schools here in our district get far less funding per kid than schools in Bonnie Lake, I'm sorry, in Seattle, Mercer Island, and Bellevue. That's just wrong and blatantly unconstitutional. Crime is rising while county governments are unable to meet the challenges of our criminal justice system and our transportation system still has major holes in it. So there are real problems out there. And unfortunately, too many politicians in both parties are not focused on solving problems. They're focused on extreme positions, partisanship, and political gains. I wanna to go to Olympia as a moderate independent to bring people together to get results and fix some of these problems that are facing our community. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Brandon Bynum. You're on mute. There you go, sorry about that. Uh, my name is Brandon Bynan. Um, a lot of people have problems pronouncing the last name, very unique. Um, I'm 49 years old. I have been in Washington since 1998. My family have been uh, residents of Washington since 1992. And I've been a very active person in the community in that time. I've been uh, running a small family business with my dad in commercial construction. And I've watched our, our state change and I don't like it. So I began to get involved. Uh, I'm actually an active member of the Pierce County Republican Party and uh, a PCO and also part of the Legislative Executive Committee. And the reason I decided to run is I felt ignored by our current representation. I would reach out and get silence. I needed help uh, during the pandemic with my wife's um, unemployment claim and had to go to a representative out of district. And I realized uh, as I stood around at my job sites and people would talk about what they wanna do and leave and go to other states, Montana, Idaho, that I love it here and I wanna fight for the state. And we need more active people involved in our governance. Uh, how many times have you heard about a bad law when you read about it the next morning? Um, I believe that our, our representatives need to be getting out there and telling us more often during the session what's going on so that we can get more feedback from people because I, I feel like we've been ignored. And um, with that said, I, I believe I'm just an average guy that understands our community better than, and no offense to the lawyers there, of a lawyer. And uh, we have so many laws and so complicated laws that I believe we need to streamline the process, uh, streamline the existing laws we have and just do a better job of representing the people. Thank you. Thank you. Holly Stanton, please. Good evening. And thank you for sponsoring this forum. Um, I am a long-term Washingtonian. I was born here. I was raised here with uh, exception of just a very few years. I've spent the majority of my life here. Um, I've been in the 31st district for 23 years and raised my children in this district. And this is home for me. 
Um, I went to Tacoma Community College. I did the University of Washington in Seattle and then went out of um, state to go to law school. I've opened my own business since uh, end of 98 and I employ a few employees here locally. Um, I believe in giving back to the community. I believe it's our civic duty to do so. Um, when the children were younger, I volunteered at their school. I volunteered at Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts. I was a troop leader and co-den leader. Um, but now that my children are older and on their way to college, I wanted to help out in a different way. So when the Democrats put out notice saying that they needed somebody to run in this district, I answered the call and put my name in. And so my hope is to uh, put forward democratic views to protect women's rights, to protect the environment, to protect voting rights, um, and, and many other of the same issues that most Democrats believe in and want to see put into place. And so anyway, thank you for your time tonight. I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Drew Stokesbury, please. Yeah, well, uh, thank you to League of Women Voters for hosting us and thanks for everybody who is watching us for giving up a little bit of your uh, Wednesday afternoon on what might be about the fourth or fifth day of summer out here. Uh, my name is Drew Stokesbury. I've had the privilege of representing the 31st District in the State House since 2015. I'm a lifelong Washingtonian. I was born and raised in the South Puget Sound, went to local public high school, uh, moved into South Auburn right after college, uh, and then again after law school. Uh, it's a great community out here and, and proud to call it home, and there's a reason why, uh, though I had the good fortune of attending uh, college and law school out of state, I, I chose to come back here, uh, and it's been a tremendous honor to uh, serve my community since 2015. Uh, in Olympia, I'm currently the ranking minority member on the House Appropriations Committee, uh, which means I spend the majority of my time down there dealing with the state budget, which is getting enormously large uh, and enormously complicated. Uh, I'm running for re-election for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that there's just a lot of things uh, that, has, that have happened in Olympia over the past couple of years that I want to make sure I fix. Uh, but more importantly, I want to fight for better schools. That's something that's been uh, tremendously important to me since I first started running. And uh, now I've got a soon to be third grader and soon to be first grader uh, of my own. I uh, also want to make sure we have safe neighborhoods. I think we've taken a giant step back in that regard over the past couple of years. Uh, and I want to make sure our economy remains strong. We are uh, in some very uncertain economic times. So uh, running to earn your vote again, I've already received the endorsement of the Seattle Times, the News Tribune, law enforcement groups, uh, and both county Republican Party organizations, and would love the opportunity to earn your support uh, during the hour we've got here. Thank you all. Um, now we come to the questions. Each candidate gets up to 90 seconds to answer each question. For some questions, I'll indicate only 60 seconds. Again, the live audience can text questions to 253-861-6824. Uh, That's 253-861-6824. The candidate order will rotate for each question. So that for question number one, we'll start with Chris Vance. And the first question is, given the fact that Washington state tax structure is the most regressive in the nation, meaning that the poorest pay the largest percentage of their income in taxes, while the richest pay the smallest portion, what legislation do you propose to make the tax structure more equitable in Washington? Chris. Yeah, you, you've really identified the problem and it's a problem that's been with us for literally decades since before I was born. Washington state has the most regressive, unfair, upside down tax system in the nation. The less you make, the more you pay as a percentage of your income. Now what's not gonna solve the problem is just adding another tax on top of the coral reef of taxes unplanned that is spread out that we already have. As bad as our tax system is, and it is bad, it's producing a lot of revenue. Revenues are up uh, double in the past 10 years. We're up to over a $60 billion state budget. I remember when I was in the house, it was not even 20 billion. The only way we're gonna solve this is through a grand bargain by getting Republicans and Democrats and business and labor and environmentalists and the unions and everybody around a table to redesign our tax system. There's parts of this that the business community hates. There's parts that other people in the community hate, but just adding another tax like the capital gains tax on top of everything else we've got, that's not tax reform. That's just higher taxes. We need tax reform, but it's gonna have to be by a, a large comprehensive 
uh, negotiated agreement. Thank you. Next person will be Brandon um, uh, Bynan. Um, what is your what legislation do you propose to make the tax structure more equitable in Washington? Um, not only is the tax structure regressive and it, and it penalizes people with low incomes. Um, I watch our children are grown and, and starting their life and I'm seeing them struggle. I help them with their tax returns. Uh, as a small business owner, I, I've seen it. I feel like the harder I work, the more money I pay. And this state, I don't believe encourages small businesses. Um, they may say differently. I, I believe that we can't tax our way out of anything. We continue to always go with the same answers. And it seems as if taxing is that answer. We need tax relief and we need to review the budget and we need to do smarter spending. Uh, we have to get away from our current legislation. Legislators says that legislative session had about a $6 billion uh, surplus going into this year. And rather than choosing to spend that wisely or bank it for a rainy day or a disaster, we spent it all and increased four more taxes on everybody. So really Washington state's suffering from tax exhaustion and we've got to find a way to spend our money that we have in a better fashion, review the budgets, get rid of, get rid of the unnecessary fat um, and just, yeah, taxing is not the answer. So we have to go back and review what we're doing and, and change what we're doing because it's not working. Thank you. Holly Stanton, what do you propose um, to make the tax structure more equitable in Washington? All right, thank you. That's a wonderful question. We do need to provide for our neighborhood. We need fair taxation. I think that's very important. The top has had way too many tax breaks and the middle class has been left holding the bag. And we need public services definitely and we have to pay for them. But how we view paying for them difference, uh, it varies depending on how you look at this. And um, the Republicans typically favor the tax breaks to the rich over the middle class. And um, Democrats typically favor taking care of the middle class. So I'm in favor of a progressive tax um, system that makes it fair across the board. Um, too often we're hearing about the super rich, they're off flying to the moon. They don't have just one yacht, they have two yachts, one to service the other yacht. That's a little too much money when there's too many of us that are at the bottom and we're struggling and we need to have that relief. So I definitely want to see a more progressive tax structure set up. Thank you. Thank you. Drew Stokesbury, what's your um, proposal to make the tax structure more equitable in Washington? Yeah, thanks for the question. I, I don't have to just promise what I will do. Uh, I can point to things that I have already done. Uh, several years ago, I was instrumental in helping the legislature pass uh, the so-called levy swap, which dramatically reduced overall property taxes paid by homeowners uh, in our neck of the woods in South King County and East Pierce County. So residents of uh, Auburn, White River, Enumclaw, Summer Bonnie Lake, school districts uh, got a net property tax cut thanks to those uh, the, the, those moves we, uh, we passed several years ago in the legislature. Uh, unfortunately, since then, uh, the majority party has reversed some of those changes and property taxes have gone back up. Uh, I also uh, led the charge to finally and fully fund uh, our state's working families tax credit, which is a sales tax rebate program uh, for low income families. It was on the books for almost 15 years, but never once funded by the majority party. Uh, I helped make sure that it was finally and fully funded. Uh, I've also proposed bills that would uh, increase the amount of that credit, especially for families with young children. Uh, I, I agree that uh, we need to continue to reform our B&O tax. It uh, really punishes small businesses. Uh, we also need to reevaluate our state's reliance on excise taxes, which is part of why our state is ranked so high uh, on regressivity. Uh, and last, but, but certainly not least, last session I proposed a bill to cut the state sales tax, and it's something I'll continue to work on. Uh, we've got the revenue to afford to, to, to cut that tax, and I think it's something the taxpayers deserve. Thank you. Uh, Clifford Knopik, what's your proposal to make the tax structure more equitable in Washington? Yeah. For some reason, we yeah. can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, I'd prefer I'd prefer uh, as little taxes as possible for everybody across the board. We need to have a government that fits the budget, not expand the budget to fit the government. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, the next question, we'll start with um, Brandon Minan. And how have you demonstrated your commitment to anti-racism? There we go. Sorry, I keep forgetting that I'm unmuting myself. There we go. Um, that's a good question. I don't really believe one has to demonstrate that they're against racism. I believe in fair treatment of everybody, equitable treatment of everybody. I give everybody the equal shot. Um, I really, I really don't see myself being any part of that. Um, and I believe that everybody's equal opportunity to be not a racist is the way to go. I, I really don't know because I don't believe that I am part of the problem and I just give everybody a fair shake. Thank you. Holly Stanton, how have you demonstrated your commitment to anti-racism? Um, thank you. That is a wonderful question. And it's, it's just something that's in my belief, it's in my being, that we need to treat everyone equally. I've always felt that way from early childhood on, always wondering why there were differences and asking my parents that question. And it, it's inevitably in our, um, in our society that we can't seem to fully get away from, but every chance I get to promote um, equality for all is something that I try to do in all ways and all means, so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Drew Stokesbury, how have you demonstrated your commitment to anti-racism? Yeah, I, I appreciate the question. Uh, the, the two items that jump out at me, uh, again, looking back at my record over the past couple of years in the legislature, uh, one was uh, we received some data that showed that uh, African-American women suffered uh, many more health complications postpartum uh, than Caucasian women. So I was instrumental in helping to passed legislation that extended Medicaid coverage to postpartum mothers, which is going to, uh, because it was African-American women that were disproportionately uh, affected by that, uh, it, it's going, that change will disproportionately uh, benefit them. Uh, I was also a co-sponsor of making Juneteenth a state holiday. Uh, and believe it or not, that actually had a fiscal impact to the state because uh, state employees will get that day off now. So we had to figure out a way uh, to make sure we could pay for that. Uh, and uh, I worked with colleagues uh, on both sides of the aisle to make sure that that was uh, something we could do because it's an important thing to recognize. Uh, and our nation has gone on too long without uh, adequately recognizing the importance of that date. So uh, those are just two of, of many examples, but uh, two recent ones from this past legislative session. Thank you. Clifford Knopic, how have you demonstrated your commitment to anti-racism? Yeah, I'd support uh, removing any legislation that racist politicians may have uh, put in place as no part in government. All humans are equal under God and have value. And uh, I'd oppose anything from anyone that uh, is against that. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Vance, how have you demonstrated your commitment to anti-racism? Well, I guess the best example, especially in recent years, is comes from my day job. Uh, I am the communications director for the King County Department of Assessments. I'm part of the management team for the department, and I handle both internal and external communications. And a big part of that is being on the team, dealing with equity and social justice and training. Uh, and we put on different programs and trainings, especially around Juneteenth and other programs. I was involved in that today, actually. We're about to do a program uh, about Disability Pride Day coming up. Um, the first thing is you've got to acknowledge that America, as great as it is, the greatest nation in the world, does have a history of deep institutional systemic racism, and now it's particularly permeating into our criminal justice system. You've got to recognize that and be willing to stand up opposed to it. Um, I have and I will. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with Holly Stanton. Um, what types of development do you see as crucial to your legislative district? And where do you propose such development given the restrictions imposed by the Growth Management Act? Holly Stanton. You need to unmute yourself. Thanks. I clicked and it didn't work the first time. All right, thank you for the question. Um, with regards to development in the area, 
you know, everyone wants to bring business into the area. And one of the ways I see doing it in a more of a community neighborhoods, we don't have as much industry in our neighborhoods, is to do it through environmental um, protection ways. So if we can bring in solar power and wind power and um, have them hooked into our grid that helps out the environment, it takes care of um, everyone and it brings um, business in. Um, and we can do the same with other areas as well. So I would see it as a way of um, helping to protect the environment, to reduce pollution and bring jobs into the area. Thank you. Thank you. Do Stokes Ferry, what types of development do you see as crucial in your legislative district? And what, where would you propose such development given the restrictions of the Growth Management Act? Yeah, I appreciate the question. Um, you know, it's no secret that we have an affordable housing crisis here in Washington state. It's been building for some time. Uh, and I don't think the legislature has done nearly enough to address it. We are uh, somewhere around a quarter of a million uh, homes short of where we need to be. Uh, and the best way to lower the price of housing is to build more housing. Uh, now there's two, two principles I believe in. Uh, one is that the, the state is much better off uh, providing incentives to build more housing rather than uh, mandating it, uh, especially when it comes to zoning laws and cities. Uh, and the other is that people should have the freedom to choose where they want to live. Uh, we should not make people live in a rural or suburban or urban environment. We should simply have those options available so people can choose how to do that. Uh, I've been pleased that a number of cities in the 31st district have chosen that it's uh, good for their communities to build more housing. Uh, I live in Auburn and I can see the number of tall buildings that are going up in Auburn. Uh, cities like Sumner are close behind them. Uh, so I would be a proponent of providing additional incentives uh, with regard to zoning, uh, tax benefits, uh, uh, exceptions or, or streamlining the GMA process for cities and counties so that they then have an incentive to zone for more housing so that builders in turn uh, have an incentive to build more housing. Uh, so with all that more housing, we can we can bring down the cost for everybody, uh, whether you're a retiree trying to stay in your home or a new college graduate trying to buy your first home, everybody deserves to have a path to home ownership and that starts with building more housing. Thank you. Um, Clifford Kanopic, what types of development do you see as crucial for your legislative district? And where do you propose that development given the restrictions of the Gross Management Act? Yeah, I think uh, Olympia shouldn't be dictating to cities what they should be doing. I trust the cities to manage themselves and I'd be supportive of whatever they decide. Um, as far as the Growth Management Act, uh, that needs to be re, uh, reworded. There's verbiage in there that allows a governor to punish cities that are deemed not compliant. Uh, and we've just seen two years of what a governor will do for people that aren't, aren't, are not compliant. So first get that out of that Growth Management Act and then um, see if you can improve it so it's a little more fair stop dictating to cities. Thanks. Chris Vance. So growth management has been a big part of my career. I voted for the second Growth Management Act as a member of the House of Representatives. I was the chairman of the King County Council's Growth Management Committee in 1994 when we enacted King County's initial comprehensive plan, drew the urban growth boundary, and, and adopted our entire strategy, which has largely been a success. We've been able to keep the Seattle area, the King County, the Puget Sound, Pierce County area from becoming like Phoenix or Los Angeles with sprawl all the way out uncontrolled to the foothills of the Cascades. No one should want that. But now I think we need to re, we need to take another look at the Growth Management Act about providing more incentives and perhaps more compulsion to the suburban cities who are served by transit in the urban area to take more density. Frankly, we don't. We shouldn't really want a lot more development up on the Bonnie Lake, Enumclaw, Buckley Plateau. That's not going to ever be really served by transit. We need more density in Sumner and Edgewood, which, um, which is, I think it is moving forward. But too many suburban cities, I don't believe, are meeting their growth targets, and the legislature is going to need to revisit that because the basic strategy of maximizing density in the urban area through infill development, so you protect the rural area served by transit is still the right strategy. Thank you, Brandon Bynan. You're on mute. Keep forgetting that you guys aren't on muting us. Um, I'm a construction professional. I've been uh, running a construction business for 25 years. Um, one of the main problems we have in addition to the restrictions that the Growth Development Act have is as a building professional, I go into building departments and struggle to get permits in a 
reasonable amount of time. Uh, we really need to look at streamlining the permitting process. Um, it's a very bloated and, and heavy process that really slows down any construction that we can do. Um, a lot of people have come to me and said, what are you going to do to keep Bonnie Lake from becoming South Hill? So it's a fine balance because we need growth because we have to control uh, housing prices, but we don't want to explode and turn into uh, other cities that people aren't desiring like up in Monroe. Um, so I think also property tax relief would be able to help that um, because property taxes obviously get passed on to renters. And um, I know that our area is exploding in growth right now because uh, you can cross the King County border and save yourself probably 30% in taxes. So uh, responsible growth and uh, again, managing our building departments better and getting input from our city councils um, as to what each city's desire is. Our area is special with uh, small towns like Enumclaw and Buckley. So we have to respect that while growing. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with Drew Stokesbury. If elected, will you ensure that Washington women have continued access to contraception and abortion? If there is an attempt to repeal HB 1851, will you vote to sustain HB 1851, which preserves a pregnant individual's ability to access abortion? Yeah, appreciate the question. Uh, can promise that uh, I will never vote uh, to remove contraceptive access. Uh, that's, that's not something I believe in uh, or something I have uh, any intention of doing. Uh, I do consider myself pro-life uh, from, from uh, birth to death. That's why I'm, uh, in addition to uh, being pro-life at birth, that's why I'm extremely skeptical uh, of the death penalty and the state's ability to take somebody's life away. Uh, it's why I've pursued uh, pro-life and pro-family policies after birth. Like I mentioned a minute ago that uh, I led the way to fully fund the working families tax credit and helped make sure that uh, postpartum mothers had access to Medicaid services uh, even after they gave birth. Uh, but as a practical matter, uh, I simply don't see uh, any uh, any bill to curtail abortion rights coming to the House floor. Um, the people of Washington have spoken on this. Uh, the the numbers are quite clear, and and I think uh, any any change to abortion access would be out of step with what the people of Washington want. Uh, so I simply don't don't foresee uh, such a bill ever coming to the floor in the first place. Thank you, Clifford Kanopic. Yeah, all medical related issues, including vaccines, must be decided upon privately, privately between people and their physician. This and other issues come down to trust, and I trust in individuals to make the best decisions for themselves, more than I trust politicians to decide. We've just seen over the last two years how politicians do not actually respect medical privacy, and they'll turn on you in an instant in an emergency. What we need is better protection of the people from the politicians, the bureaucrats, the industries who are partnering to exploit the people. All state agencies and the employees and politicians may not be allowed to coerce, bribe, punish, pressure, advertise, or advocate for medical related issues that should be private, including abortions and vaccines. If they do, they should be held liable for harm caused. If anyone has been caused by any kind of uh, coercion, they should be compensated for that. Now, citizens who are concerned about people getting abortions, they need to stop looking to politicians and the force of government as the answer. Given the right emergency, they will turn on. Your sound again has gone out. Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, for us.org, they're now waiting for solutions from the government. Thank you. Thank you, Chris Vance. So the Supreme Court's recent outrageous decision overturning 50 years of precedent, and I guess stare decisis doesn't exist anymore in our legal vernacular, has made this the issue in every state legislative race everywhere in America. My position on this is crystal clear and always has been. Washington state is the only state in the nation where the people made our abortion laws. The people of this state voted in 1970 to legalize abortion. The people voted in 1991 to codify Roe v. Wade. I will not use my vote on the Senate floor to overturn the will of the people of the state of Washington. I will absolutely 100% protect Washington state's pro-choice laws and strengthen them to help people coming here to, uh, to get these services in states that will not provide them. This is a critical issue and I am firm and clear on this. 
Thank you. Um, Brandon Bynan. There you go. Um, as Chris said, uh, this state has had legal abortion since 1970 prior to Roe v. Wade. Um, I consider myself pro-life, but I also consider um, when it comes to personal values for people, I tend to fall more towards a libertarian point of view. I do not believe in forcing my beliefs on other people within reason, um, but I would not, I, I, we cannot take people's rights to choice. Uh, the art of politics is bringing somebody over to the other side or to your point of view uh, within reason. So uh, this actually, Mr. Stokesbury just got in a uh, small spat with our governor regarding this because uh, Drew had said that this was already entrenched in Washington politics and our if governor- mean, We don't refer to other candidates. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, but our governor was was basically saying that the Republican Party as a whole said that we wouldn't take it and wants us to support a constitutional amendment to make uh, abortion part part of constitutionally protected. I have not heard back from the governor, but I counterproposed and said, uh, how about we provide medical autonomy to all citizens of Washington and let them all decide what they feel is best for them. Therefore, vaccine mandates would also be up to people. You would get the choice of abortion and vaccine. Uh, I believe it's our, our duty to give people the choice of what they want to do with their lives. Thank you. Holly Stanton, please. All right, thank you. Um, this is really a critical issue that we're dealing with right now. And the Supreme Court totally got it wrong. Um, they threw out 50 years of case law for political and religious reasons. Um, people have a fundamental right to bodily autonomy and the right to choose if and when to grow their family should be protected at all costs. I am for amending the constitution to protect um, a, our rights to choose here in Washington state. And I think that we do need to take that step and do that. I would um, never vote against the right to have that choice. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question, we'll start with uh, Clifford Knopic. And um, what legislation would you propose to make housing more affordable to residents in your legislative district? Yeah, I'd support re repealing any regulations that are getting in the way of uh, buying houses and driving up the prices, like it was mentioned about permits, um, being able to create uh, houses quicker and more affordable for people. So anything like that um, where the government's getting in the way, I support removing those laws and regulations. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Vance. Well, th this essentially goes back to the discussion about the Growth Management Act. Housing is a commodity like anything else. Prices are driven by supply and demand. Right now, we have a very high level of demand for housing in the Puget Sound region, and the supply is not keeping up. We need more of all types of housing, from shelters all the way up to traditional stick-built single-family houses and cul-de-sacs in the suburbs. We need more of everything. So we need to continue to robustly fund the programs that are helping out there with subsidized housing, but we need to free up the private sector to build more housing in the urban area, mostly served by transit. We need to double and triple down on infill development in the suburban cities that are along I-5 and along Pacific Highway South and 167 that can be served by transit. Um, that's where we need to, to build more and denser housing. It, it, if we don't increase supply, we're never gonna bring down prices. Thank you, Brandon Bynan. There we go. Um, as a construction professional, again, this is a subject near and dear to me. Uh, it's a complicated one because it, there's so many other factors in terms of labor costs, uh, costs of materials. And currently right now, thanks to the post-pandemic world shortage of materials, uh, I'm often seeing uh, special items like HVAC units 16 to 20 weeks out. Um, so kind of switching gears on that, one of the things we need to do is provide tax relief, lower permitting fees, try to increase the ability for contractors to get out of way, increase our economic values uh, within, within the district of trying to provide some tax relief, make it cheaper to build, easier to build, more accessible to build. Um, obviously the private sector runs that greatly and we need to keep money in people's pockets to keep them buying and keep 
people able to move into homes. Thank you, Holly Stanton. All right, thank you. It's a great question. Um, in my area, I noticed that what they're building are million dollar homes or, or close enough to million dollar homes. And what we're missing out on is the majority of people who want homes are middle class. They're earning 60 to 150,000 a year on average, and they cannot afford the homes that are being built in this area. Now I know that construction companies make more money off these larger homes than they would off the smaller homes, which means that we're gonna to have to come up with some kind of tax incentives in order to get that done. But we need to have smaller homes that are there for our average working families. They shouldn't have to choose between buying food and paying for a home. They should be able to afford the homes that are out there. And the market has just gotten to a really crazy place. So we also need to have um, housing alternatives out there for the low income too, so that they have a place. We don't need them on the streets and in tents and in bad situations. We need to find them a place. In Texas, I believe that they set something up where they put everyone in a house for a year. It's an apartment, but it's, they're off the streets. If they can do it in Texas, we can certainly do it up here. So thank you. Thank you, Drew Stokesbury. Once again, appreciate the question. Uh, and uh, it is similar to a, a topic that we discussed uh, a little earlier this evening. But uh, um, as others have said, we need to build more housing. And what's frustrating about uh, about this topic is that we know we know what the answer is uh, and we know how to solve the problem. Uh, the legislation exists. What is missing so far is the political will in Olympia to do it. Um, I've, I've had that political will, but unfortunately, uh, not enough. There hasn't been enough. Uh, there have been members on both sides of the aisle who have supported these, this approach, but uh, not always a majority in both chambers as needed. Uh, but we need to pass uh, the, the missing middle housing bill that will incentivize cities and counties to do rezoning that will add more housing predominantly in urban areas that already have high density and that can support further density. Uh, the huge elephant in the room here is the city of Seattle, which has the infrastructure to add far more units than they currently have. Uh, we also need to pass tax legislation that will provide incentives to developers to build and preserve affordable housing. Uh, so we, we know what the answers are. We have the legislation drafted. We just need 50 members in the House and 25 members in the Senate and the governor willing to pass this into law. I am one of them and I'll remain one of them uh, if I'm reelected this year. Thank you. Next question. Um, and we'll start with Chris Vance on this question. Um, what legislation would you support or propose um, to address climate change? Chris Vance. Well, the first thing again is you have to acknowledge that it's real and too many politicians out there on the far right just want to deny science and deny what your own eyes can see. I live in Sumner and a couple of years ago the hill above us exploded in flames for the first time ever. Uh, the climate is changing all around us. Washington state has taken major steps forward to lead on climate change with clean fuel standards and cap and trade legislation uh, and many other pieces of legislation um, to try and address the area of climate change. I don't know if all of it's going to work, um, but we need to give it a chance. Um, we need to let these new pieces of legislation, again, regarding clean fuels and, and uh, cap and trade legislation, let's see how they affect uh, the economy and fuel prices before we abandon them, because it, it is a noble effort to try and lead on climate. But let's always also remember that this is a very, very carbon friendly state because we get two thirds of our power from hydroelectric dams. And the dumbest thing we could ever do if you care about climate is tear down those dams. Uh, because now you're just gonna, you're gonna need coal fire plants or nuclear plants or oil plants to replace them. Um, so I, I'm very happy with what the, the legislature has done in recent years. Now we'll see if it, it uh, makes a real impact. Thank you, Brandon Bynan. Hi there. Uh, so climate change is obviously a very real thing, but our solution to this state tends to be tax our way out of it. And I don't see how a lot of these programs and the taxes are being responsibly spent on how it would actually reward versus the money being spent. And this actually ties back into the previous question that it 
some of these legislate, legislative ideas have stifled growth. Um, for example, we can't use gas, natural gas in construction now in certain areas for HVAC and we're depending on electric. I, I don't understand where the thought is of how that changes the carbon footprint to uh, no longer use gas and increase the toll on our electric grid system. Um, we need to look at balance. We cannot stifle growth at all costs. And I feel like right now we are over the top on the carbon friendly and, and it's hurting the growth of the two questions we previously had could be answered by finding a happy median. And the answer is not always tax, it's incentives. We should provide incentives for people to do things greener um, versus penalties to not do it the right way. Thank, thank you. you. Holly Stanton. All right, thank you for this question. I'm a long-term environmentalist. Um, I'm also a realist. There is no perfect solution. I wish I had it, um, but we do need to look at the science and we, do, we need to do as much as possible, as quickly as possible to reduce our impact on the environment. Promoting electric cars, promoting wind power, solar power, giving tax incentives out for anyone that puts those on their roof or at their home or um, purchases one, um, those are important things. I think COVID also helped us because it showed us that we can do jobs from home. We can appear virtually for things like we're doing today instead of traveling and that that helps reduce the impact on the environment. Um, <clears throat> Republicans have been a huge roadblock here, a lot of them denying science. I'm glad to hear a few tonight are saying just the opposite that they believe in the science. Um, it seems like it's always like one step forward and two steps back um, with our long-term um, ability to protect our planet and the balance. 98% of scientists cannot be wrong on this. We need to do everything we can and we need to do it sooner than later. When I was a, a young child, I remember being taught in school how important this was. And here all these years later, we're still fighting over the issue of whether the science is true um, or what we can do in that regard. Um, one example of the, the problems where we have is that we put solar panels on the White House and then the first Republican got back in and tore them off the White House. We can't keep doing that. We have to all be on the same page and admit that this is um, real, it's happening, and we need to protect our environment. And thank you. Thank you. Drew Stokesbury. Yeah, I, I, I like, uh, like others, um, don't dispute that climate change exists. So what I do dispute is that Washington State on its own can do anything to meaningfully solve the problem that's before us. Um, during the time, during the hour or so that we're going to be meeting here, China will emit more carbon into the atmosphere than Washington State will emit over the entire year. So the idea that we're going to ask Washingtonians to pay for the failings of the country and of other countries, I don't think it's something that the legislature ought to be doing. Uh, over the past couple of years, there have been some bills that have been passed in a law. Uh, I have mostly opposed them. Uh, one was just analyzed by the Washington Research Council within the last week or so uh, that suggests that the compliance costs will add 50 cents, the price, 50 cents per gallon to the price of gasoline sorry, next year uh, and nearly a dollar by the end of the decade. Uh, I don't think that Washingtonians who are already paying the highest uh, highest gas prices that, that we've paid in my lifetime uh, need to be paying an extra dollar a year to essentially have a symbolic victory over a problem that we alone can't solve. This is something that needs national and international work, not state level work, but unfortunately, Washington taxpayers are gonna be stuck paying the bill uh, to give some other politicians the feel good story that they want. Thank you. Clifford Knopic. Yeah, I mean, uh, the climate's been changing for billions of years. I think it's uh, kind of arrogant for humans to think that uh, we can just solve it all in uh, four years or something like that. Um, I would like to see what the goals were on any legislation. If it's a uh, constitutional legislation, doesn't raise taxes, doesn't infringe on people's rights and liberties, it actually accomplishes something. Uh, I'd read through it, consider it. Um, more often than not, we end up with stupid laws like the plastic bag law, where you're getting uh, taxed with the eight cent tax if you forget your uh, personal bags. Uh, the plastic bags are 10 times the amount of plastic that were before the law. Um, I think more often than not, 
it makes it worse. So I think we just need to be careful on and have precise goals before we just pass anything. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question we'll, stand, we'll start with Brandon uh, Bynan. Um, approximately one in nine residents of the 31st district speak a language other than English. If elected, how will you engage and work alongside communities that speak languages other than English? Brandon. Well, uh, one of the reasons I'm running again is, uh, as I said, community engagement and getting out there. Uh, our current representation, I, I, I don't see them out in the public. So uh, I've been, while out campaigning, out at parades, shaking people's hands, meeting everybody I can. Uh, I think it's your role as a, quote, representative to get out and talk to the community. Uh, it's my goal to be engaging, go out, attend, attend functions, be available, um, and get to know the needs of the people of our district. Because as I said, I, I feel like our current representation does not represent us. They, they, they live in a world and they pass laws where it doesn't seem to get enough input from us. So for me, it's getting out to be available, not just sit behind closed doors or hide. Uh, I want to return all the phone calls I can. And in cases where people don't speak similar languages, use resources such as translators and whatever else it takes. But we do need to represent every voting member of our district. Thank you. Holly Stanton. All right. Thank you for the question. Um, our country is a melting pot and we have a very diverse um, group of people that call ourselves Americans and we need to reach out to all of them and talk to them all. And if that means um, getting translation in there, then we need to make sure that we have that. I know um, because I'm an attorney, I work at the courthouse and we have interpreters that come in with many you know, different languages. I'm amazed at how many languages all the different interpreters have. And so those types of services we need to have in the public setting too, so that we can talk to all of our constituents and understand what their needs are and help them with their needs. So thank you. Thank you, Drew Stokesbury. Yeah, uh, I, I am uh, monolingual, unfortunately, despite, despite my best efforts, uh, I, I have never been able to pick up, uh, to pick up foreign languages. Um, and while both, uh, both sides of my family have been in the United States since before we were the United States, uh, I, I, like others have mentioned, uh, am tremendously grateful for all of the contributions uh, that immigrants have made to this country, uh, many of whom come here uh, for better opportunities uh, and don't speak the language. And that just shows you uh, how amazing our country is if you are willing to come here uh, and not speak the language and have that still be the, the, the best deal for you. Um, you know, while, while I can't uh, personally speak Spanish uh, or, or Marshallese or Ukrainian with any of my constituents, uh, I am proud of some of the things I have helped do in the legislature. Uh, on the Appropriations Committee, I have helped secure additional funding for court interpreters, uh, both for uh, witnesses and for crime victims, uh, to make sure that everybody is entitled to due process uh, and their rights in a language that they understand. Uh, I have provided funding to OSPI and school districts so that uh, schools can communicate with parents uh, in their native language. One of the biggest determinants of student success is parental engagement. That's not something we can easily mandate in the legislature, but we can at least make sure that parents have the ability to be involved by having materials in their home language. So uh, there's a number of other issues, but I see time running out, but uh, I think that's the biggest thing we can do uh, in Olympia is make sure that folks who don't speak English still have the opportunity to meaningfully engage with their government. Thank you. Clifford Kanopic. Yeah, I sympathize uh, with everyone who doesn't feel represented. Uh, I feel the same way. Uh, I expect it's even worse for someone who has trouble communicating. Um, everybody has value and is important and should be represented. And I make myself available um, and supportive and encourage uh, removing any roadblocks that are in the way for them to succeed and excel in America. Uh, that's what I would do. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Vance. So we have to recognize that, that our community is becoming more diverse, which is a great thing. Um, most of us speak English, but not all. And everyone has a right to access their government and understand what their government is doing and petition their government for redresses, um, whether you speak English or not. Um, I've worked on this as, again, uh, the communications director for the assessor's office. I was in charge of the project 
of translating all of our materials, all of our brochures, all of our forms and our webpage into the seven major dominant languages in the King County area and, and work on signage for the department and all those sorts of things. And I'll do the same thing in the Senate as after I win and I'm setting up my Senate office, I'm, I'll uh, find out what are the major languages other than English that are spoken in the 31st district, most likely Spanish is at the top of the list, uh, and make sure that our materials, the web page, um, are translated into those languages and that we have uh, translation services available for uh, my office staff. We, again, I mean, everyone should have the right to access their government, um, whatever language they speak. Thank you. The next question will be 60 seconds and we'll start with Holly Stanton. Um, and do you support legislation in Washington state for universal health care? Absolutely, that's a great question and I do. Um, we have too many people who are without insurance who are in that, in that middle gap. Right now we have great insurance if you're super poor if you happen to work at a good company like Boeing um, or with the state, you have great insurance, but then there's still a huge amount of people um, who are out there who cannot afford what they have. Um, and we need to have that state option. The insurance companies went for profit. That was the, the worst decision that we could have ever done. And <clears throat> what used to be a reasonable amount to pay every month for insurance has now escalated. All the while they're telling you what you, is not covered by the insurance. And while they're getting record profits and their CEOs are being paid millions of dollars a year. So we definitely need to have health care that takes um, the state option into effect. You can still let people like Boeing or state employees have their private insurance, but anyone who wants it should be able to buy into the state option. Thank you. Thank you. Drew Stokesbury. Yeah, I, I, I don't support uh, this, this idea as it's kind of commonly conceptualized. One thing I've learned uh, in my time down in Olympia is that good intentions don't necessarily make for good law. Uh, we saw this firsthand when Washington attempted to pass uh, the Long-Term Care Trust Act. Uh, legislators had this idea that if we could, uh, as a state, only provide long-term care insurance, we could fix a broken private market, uh, provide coverage uh, to people who might want or need it. Uh, but unfortunately, that attempt really crashed and burned. The system is already insolvent. We're going to have to double the tax rate to make it solvent. Uh, we've already hit pause for two years. I'm not sure it'll ever really work out the way politicians planned. I don't think Washington State uh, should be in the long-term care insurance business, and I don't think it should be in the health insurance business either. Uh, that's not to say the current system is perfect. It's far from it, but I think we need to make uh, more, more targeted choices to make sure that uh, patients aren't balanced billed, for example, uh, that uh, insurers aren't disincentivized from covering uh, battling the cancer drugs, things like that. I've been a leader on those issues and will continue to be done in Olympia. Thank you very much. Um, Clifford Kanopic. Yeah, um, I don't aff aff approve of, of uh, extra taxes, large bureaucratic organization that is just gonna give uh, the least amount of service for the most amount of people. Um, definitely things are obviously broken in the system where there's these uh, different imbalances. And so anywhere the government's causing that should be removed, all regulations that are causing monopolies or whatever that are uh, hindering the expansion and access for as many people as possible should be removed. And I'd support anything like that. Thank you. Thank you, Chris Vance. So if the definition of universal healthcare is a single payer government run system with no private or employer provided insurance, my answer is no, I've never supported that. Uh, because too many Americans, including teachers and cops and firefighters, have good benefits and good health insurance that they don't want to give up. At the same time, I can't imagine living in this society, raising kids in this society without health insurance. Every American needs to have access to good health insurance that they can afford. In Washington state, we have consistently moved towards that. Uh, first, with the passage of the Basic Health Act, all the way back when I, Basic Health Plan, all the way back when I was in the legislature, and now the Apple Health and the expanded public option, the government needs to provide affordable health care coverage to everyone who is left behind by the private markets or they're not old enough for Medicare or, or too well off for Medicaid. That's what we've been trying to do in this state for decades. We need to keep moving down that road. 
Thank you, Brandon Bynum. Uh, like Chris said, if the definition is a single payer system, I am opposed to it. However, uh, universal healthcare is a concept that is very near and dear to me. I have experienced a traumatic event in my life that caused me to have five emergency surgeries in a two and a half year period. And I nearly lost everything because of the out of network bills and the other things that had happened from our insurance being so overly complicated and most people wouldn't have gotten through it. Uh, I was very lucky. Um, so the concept needs to be that the government should be able to provide insurance for all. Um, but we need to look at when middle class people need it for help like I did. Um, I, had I been had I had nothing, I wouldn't have been in financial ruin over it. But because I had something, the concept was I had to lose everything before I could get help. So we need to we need to find a way to allow private insurance to compete while the government can find it can provide a fallback option. But I'm absolutely against single payer insurance. Thank you. Next question. We'll go back to 90 seconds and we'll start with Drew Stokesbury. Um, what legislation do you support or propose to promote the safety, well-being, and education of school children in your legislative district? Do Stokesbury, please. Yeah, well, uh, one of the reasons I first was motivated to run for the legislature is to make sure that every Washington student, uh, regardless of zip code, had a chance to receive a world-class world education that would prepare them for college or career. Uh, when I was first elected, Washington was in the middle of the uh, McCleary court case uh, where the, the court correctly uh, decided that the state had woefully and unconstitutionally underfunded K-12 education. Uh, over the next couple of years, we made tremendous strides. Uh, we increased K-12 funding dramatically. It is now over 50% of the state budget. Uh, the next steps, which I was focused on before, uh, during, and, and now after, uh, are making sure that, that money translates into results. Uh, funding schools simply for the sake of funding schools, I don't think is really that important. Uh, the whole point of money is not, not the zeros on the check, but is to uh, improve results and improve outcomes. So I want to make sure that we improve our th third grade reading rates, which is uh, a tremendous indicator of uh, future educational attainment. I want to make sure that uh, everybody, especially uh, lower income and minority students, have access to high quality, high caliber uh, educations, including AP and, and IB classes. Uh, and I want to make sure that uh, students uh, at every end of the spectrum, uh, including special ed students, uh, are equipped with the uh, the, the support that they need so that they, can, they too can uh, successfully enjoy the benefits of a public education in Washington State. Thank you. Clifford Kanopic. Yeah, I think uh, politicians definitely need to keep their promise of fully funding education. Uh, and, that, and part of that is also safety of the children, including the building structure um, and security uh, if, a, if a school thinks they need it. Um, I also appr uh, approve and uh, am some supportive of any sort of creative new way to expand options. Um, not everybody learns the exact same way. Uh, so we need more options, whether it's private, public. Um, I'd be interested in uh, researching and looking at legislation for vouchers, uh, anything to have the most amount of uh, creative options available uh, for the students. Thank you. Thank you, Chris Vance. This is job one for me, and it should be job one for every single person who runs for the legislature. Unfortunately, it's not, because the Washington state constitution is a very different than many other states in that it says it is the paramount duty of the state of Washington to amply fund a uniform system of public education. I was a senior advisor to Superintendent of Public Instruction, Randy Dorn. I worked on his staff during the McCleary years and lived this issue and fought on this issue um, basically, the state of Washington must define basic education and then pay for it, all of it, including construction. And the legislature uh, has taken a few steps forward and then two or three steps back. And we're still left with a situation where this last spring, you saw multiple school districts passing levies, some failing, jobs at risk. Here in Sumner, they're building half a high school because the voters didn't approve one of the bond issues. It's absurd. Our school funding system right now is, create, is unstable and unfair, and the place where it's worst 
is where my wife works. She is a special education paraeducator in the Auburn School District, and special ed is the number one thing that is underfunded. And just imagine that. That means that you know kids with autism and Down syndrome and other major problems in some school districts are getting good services, and others they're not. It's unconscionable. I will not vote for a state budget that does not make significant progress towards fully funding education in the state without the use of levies. Thank you. Brandon Bynan. I interpret this question slightly different than the other candidates when you were asking how I plan to make schools safer. Um, as a construction professional, I sit around and I've past all of the buildings and even participated in construction of some of our local schools. And when you hear people tell you that they have to spend money or they lose it, it, it sends shivers through my spine as a taxpayer. Um, I, I grew up in the 70s and 80s and the school I attended by today's standards would look like a FEMA trailer camp. And I got a fine education because it's not about the architectural masterpiece of the building, it's about the contents of the education within. And we need to stop worrying so much about building these absolutely gorgeous architectural masterpieces for our kids. They don't care. It's about the quality of education. And uh, as Chris referred to with the levies being turned down by the voters, that just shows the tax exhaustion on, on people when they choose not to fully fund schools for their kids. It means that we are being taxed to death and the irresponsible use of our money has to stop. We can build fine functional facilities that have secure entries and secure exits and provide a quality education for our children with, with much less funds and do it better. Uh, we choose not to, we encourage the school districts to spend every dollar they get, whereas I think maybe we should provide an incentive to save money and give a bonus to some of the teachers within it if they don't spend it all. Thank you. Thank you, Holly Stanton. All right, thank you. This is a great question. Um, our tax dollars should go to public schools and we should pay for our public schools. And we need to ensure that all of our students and all of our schools are treated equally financially. So the levy issue, we should not be having to beg for the money and the money should not be um, put upon all of the middle class America to cover. It should be covered at the state level with a fair progressive tax schedule and it should be across the board. And so it's, we just should not be putting it in as um, having them beg to get the needed uh, funds that they have for school. And since you mentioned safety, I'm gonna also mention um, that we also need some common sense gun safety reform in our state. <clears throat> There's been way too many mass shootings, way too many of these are happening at our schools and we need to be able to protect them. And so just getting rid of the um, automatic and semi-automatic firearms in our public could save so many lives. So thank you. Thank you. Next question, um, what legislation would you propose to prepare the state for the next pandemic or regional emergency? We'll start with Clifford Knopic. Well, I think uh, a review of the Department of Health and uh, what happened the last two years is in order. Um, it, it, the governor Department of Health scrapped everything we've learned for the last 20 years for pandemic preparedness and uh, ran into the direction of pseudoscience nonsense. Um, we can't do that for something that is actually has a higher fatality rate, which sooner or later will be coming. So I'd support um, reviewing what happened, uh, putting laws in place that stop a governor from having an endless emergency uh, and exploiting it for uh, politics instead of uh, safety. Thank you. Thank you, Chris Vance. So over the past several years, I've been very disappointed many times in the actions taken by my former party, the Republican Party, and nothing's disappointed me more than their grandstanding reaction to the pandemic. You know, if we'd have done what a lot of politicians wanted to do, we'd have had the death rates that they had in states that Republicans did what they did. You know, masking and vaccines and quarantines is the normal way that a civilized society deals with a pandemic. It's not unusual. We've been doing it for hundreds of years and we were right to do that. And because of that, there's 10 or 15,000 more people alive today in Washington state. So, but we do have to move forward now to implement some of the things we've learned. I've read through the, the laws and the RCWs and they're very unclear uh, on exactly what you do 
in, in certain pandemics, there's there's uh, specific laws about tuberculosis, but it doesn't go, I mean, about, it doesn't go far enough. And the situation with the governor being able to declare an emergency that it's not clear the legislature can ever lift, that is troubling. I'm not criticizing what Governor Inslee did. I think he was right to take the steps he took, but there doesn't seem to be any accountability to the executive on, um, on emergencies. The legislature probably needs to pass a law to allow the legislature by resolution, which can't be vetoed by the governor, to lift a state of emergency. But we, we need to take these, take these situations seriously and, and not have a lot of grandstanding nonsense on public health issues. Thank you, Brandon Bynum. Uh, I think that's a great question. Uh, what we currently experienced from the pandemic uh, largely was in fact to legislation that we presented after the Oso mudslide up in Arlington in 2014. We voted for uh, measures to allow Governor Inslee to have these emergency powers. Um, didn't really think it out as usual. Um, a, a disaster happens, we overcorrect, and then we later find that we've suffered from it. Uh, I absolutely did not agree with the way the pandemic was handled. I disagree with both parties sitting around and staying in a deadlock. Um, we absolutely positively need people to be able to live their own lives. Uh, as a small business owner, the pandemic was crushing for people. I watched businesses fall, families fall apart. I saw increased drug addiction, increased suicide rates. We have to allow people to be in charge of their own lives. Um, too many bureaucrats were in charge of people's lives during that time. And Governor Inslee does need to have, or our current governor does need to have some ability to react in a pandemic or an emergency, but we absolutely have to have checks. And he's currently unchecked and will sit in office until 2024 under emergency powers. So it's imperative that we set up a check ballot system again and that we pass term limits as well. Um, I, I did not agree with mandatory masking. I did not agree with mandatory shutdowns of business. People are adults, let them live their own lives and make educated decisions. We need to allow people, give them the information and let them do what they need to do. Thank you, thank Holly you. Stanton. All right, thank you. Um, we were in a pandemic, COVID was very serious. The hospitalizations were out of control. Um, the nurses were overworked. The doctors were overworked. People were dying, way too many people were dying. We needed to take action. We needed to quarantine. We needed to do masking. Um, thank goodness we have vaccines now and we need to encourage those vaccines um, and the booster shots. Um, unfortunately, we are gonna have to learn to live with COVID. Um, and that means that if this is gonna be something that's gonna be with us for the rest of our lives. Fortunately, we do have the vaccines. We do have the boosters. We do know how to do the treatments now that we didn't know how to do when this first happened and we have monoclonal antibodies. There are so many things that we can do to help people that the hospitalizations are not nearly as scary. The deaths are not nearly as high as they were, but did we need to do the actions that we took back then? Of course we did. Um, but now we need to try to figure out a way to learn to live with this and to keep um, going with vaccines and, and all of the other treatments. So thank you. Thank you, Drew Stosky. Yeah, uh, I, a couple things uh, to share. Uh, for several years when I was in the legislature before the pandemic, uh, public health officials and public health advocates uh, were telling the legislature just how underfunded uh, foundational public health was across Washington state. Uh, unfortunately, all the proposals to increase public health, foundational public health funding relied on new tax increases. Uh, my perspective was that if foundational public health was as important of a priority as folks claimed it was, and I agreed that it should be a high priority, it should be funded out of existing revenue. Uh, it should be high, more highly prioritized than some of the other things we we're spending money on. Uh, unfortunately, that never happened before the pandemic, but thankfully it did happen during the pandemic, uh, was able to defeat a tax increase on insurers uh, and replace it with funding for foundational public health out of the uh, existing state revenue out of the existing operating budget. Uh, so that's one thing that uh, we have to look forward to if there is another pandemic that uh, we now have a more stable funding source for foundational public health. 
Uh, I also agree that uh, uh, fixing the governor's emergency powers is critical to making sure that the entire state of Washington will trust whoever is in charge making those decisions, regardless of what party. Uh, who knows uh, if the next governor is going to be a Democrat or Republican, but all of Washington should be able to trust their governor. Uh, many other states, including the liberal bastions of California and New York, Wisconsin, uh, have uh, a more balanced set of emergency powers between the governor and the legislature. It's consistent with what our founding fathers uh, for the state and country would want, uh, and I think that's the direction we need to go. Thank you. Okay, for the last, this is the last question, um, and it'll be 60 seconds, and we'll start with Chris Vance. Um, in this era of partisan deadlock, how will you work across the aisle in the legislature for the benefit of the people of Washington? Chris Vance. Wow. Wow. I think my candidacy uh, is, is evidence of that. I'm running to be the first independent in the history of the Washington State Legislature. I'm running as an independent because that's what I am. I'm not a Republican anymore. I'm not a Democrat. Uh, and I shouldn't have to be in order to run for public office. There, there's, we should not have to belong to either of these two parties that have become so extreme and divisive. Um, I think just the, my presence in the Senate is going to help to bring people together. It's likely to be a narrow margin in the Senate. And as a moderate, uh, independent, I think I can help bridge the gap people. I also have experience doing this. Um, I served in the legislature when it was far more bipartisan than it is today. And I served on the King County Council when we had a seven to six Republican majority, but a Democrat executive, and everything had to be collaborative and bipartisan and done by compromise. That's what's missing in our politics today in Washington, D.C. and in Olympia. And I, I think electing some people who aren't Republicans or Democrats, aren't locked into these two parties, would be very helpful. Thank you. Um, Brandon Bynan, how will you work across the aisle for the benefit of the people of Washington? Well, I think first and foremost, uh, this is actually quite part of my campaign as well. You, when you decide to run for public office, you have to put a letter next to your name. Um, honestly, I believe in the state of Washington, if you put independent next to your name, you have a very uphill battle. Uh, you want to know what letter I put next to my name and you want to watch these interviews to learn about my personality and who I am as my character. Uh, to trust me to lead, but my ultimate responsibility is not to do what I'm told by my party or even necessarily follow my personal beliefs. It's do what is best for the citizens of our district and our state. Um, I'm not going to compromise just because we have to. I will compromise on things that are needed. As a small business owner, I understand what's really going on in this state we spend too much time in legislature arguing over things that aren't helping and aren't doing anything and are too worried about taxing our way into a bigger budget. We have to respect what the people of Washington need, sit down and put our letters aside and do what's best, make actual laws and make actual reform to this state based off of the needs of our constituents. Thank you. Holly Stanton. All right. I want to thank you for the question. I also want to thank you for the time today that you've spent with all of us to uh, give us this opportunity to talk um, out about all of our different issues and our ways of looking at everything. Um, with regards to this question in particular, um, as an attorney, I have always tried to work with the other sides, finding mediation, finding collaborative ways to come to a resolution. And I regularly help people find that so that they don't um, go to trial. And I would do the same thing in a political way. I would reach across the aisle. I would find solutions so that we could um, come up with the legislation that we need to take care of the citizens of our state. So thank you. Thank you. Drew Stokesbury. Well, uh, appreciate the question. Once again, I uh, don't have to promise how I will act. Uh, I can point folks to see how I have acted uh, over my last couple of terms. Uh, I care about ideas far more than I care about party labels or the people in charge of uh, a respective party. If you have a good idea, I want to work with you. Uh, I won the uh, Association of Washington Cities City Champion Award twice for uh, work I did across the aisle with Democrats. One was a bill uh, to help cities obtain body cameras. The other was a bill to help cities uh, earn a greater share of uh, 
tax funding. Uh, I worked with a Democrat legislator to create uh, individual health plans for students with epilepsy so that they could have the same kind of services and support that students with diabetes already get. I mentioned that I led the way to finally and fully fund the Working Families Tax Credit, a policy that was proposed by Democrats 15 years ago, but, but never funded. Uh, and when all was said and done, I got my entire caucus to support funding what was originally a Democratic idea. So I care about ideas that are going to help the people of Washington, uh, and I'm willing to work with anybody who shares those ideas. Generally, they're going to be more conservative and more Republican, but uh, I don't think either party has a complete monopoly. Uh, and that's why I've been happy to work with Democrats uh, when, when they're right on things. Thank you. Clifford Kanopic. Yes, thanks again for tonight. Um, I am open to working with anyone uh, that has a bill and, or an idea that's constitutional, does not raise taxes, uh, is working towards a less intrusive government, uh, and first and foremost puts the people first. I'm not beholden to either party, uh, nor any special interest groups. Uh, I truly am independent. I appreciate your time, thanks. Thank you. Um, now it's time for closing statements. Each candidate has up to one minute for their closing statement. We'll change the order of the opening statement. So we'll start with um, Brandon um, Bynan. Yes, thank you. Thank you again for having us. Um, my closing statement is I am not a politician. I am an average guy, salt of the earth person, just like most of the people in our district. Um, I believe a lot of us are tired of the way the current system is and our current leadership. And it's time that people stand up and get involved and we have average people representing us. My entire candidacy relies on this primary. And I hope that a lot of people are willing to vote for change and realize that we've sat around too long, complained and let other people lead our lives. And our founding fathers were geniuses. And when they set our government up, they intended for the average person to go do their volunteer and civic duty for a while and then go back to their lives and never make a career of it. We need term limits. We need common sense people in office. We need to realize that running the country and the state is a business and it needs to be done responsibly by ethical people who are doing what's best for our citizens. By voting for me, that is what you will get. I will be available. I will be out there and I will serve our community. Thank you. Holly Stanton. All right, <clears throat> thank you again for the invitation to come tonight. Um, I am proudly running for the first time and I'm very excited to be able to stand for the democratic values um, that I do. And I believe that our representation needs to be reflective of all those values. And if elected, that's gonna be my plan in office is to promote those, to take care of our environment, to ensure that women's rights are protected, to protect voting rights, to take care of housing, to take care of homelessness, um, basically all of the things that we need to do to make our state great and to do fair taxation. So uh, that will be my goal. And um, I appreciate you taking the time this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Do Stokes Ferry. Once again, uh, thanks to League of Women Voters for putting this on and moderating this panel and coming up with some great questions. And thanks to everybody who spent their uh, Wednesday nights uh, watching us. And I hope you found this informative. Um, I, uh, while well, I've been in office for a couple of terms now, I too am just a, an ordinary guy. I had flag football practice with my six-year-old last night. Uh, got, got three young boys, uh, all under the age of eight. Um, I have a small business uh, on Main Street in downtown Sumner. I'm a member of the board of directors of Auburn YMCA. Uh, I've been very blessed and privileged to have a lot of good fortune in my life. Uh, and it's been really enjoyable to serve the people of the 31st district and give back. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, and I'll remind you again, I, I wanna go back to Olympia for one more term to make sure that we uh, continue to fight for better schools, safer neighborhoods and a stronger economy. Uh, I, I think uh, it's important to understand how Olympia works. State government has unfortunately gotten extremely complicated over the years. Uh, and in this uncertain time, I think we need some uh, experienced hands willing to shake up the status quo. And I think I can continue to do that for the people of the 31st district. Thank you, Clifford Kanopic. Yes, thanks. Uh, we're living in some strange times, times which do not require politics as usual. Uh, I encourage you to ask hard questions, seek the answers, submit your own public record verify everything you're being told, demand your legislature to not abdicate their responsibilities. If you want someone to lead and to speak up in defense of the citizens, someone who understands data and science and will not stay silent when it's misused, 
If you want someone who will work towards a less intrusive government, then I appreciate your support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris Vance. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for performing the function you always perform, and that's promoting our democracy. Um, we've talked about a lot of issues here tonight, but the overarching issue is nothing less than the survival of our democracy. All across the country, Americans are losing faith in our political system. You know, the first time I ran for the legislature, I was 26 years old. That was a very long time ago. I lost, but I've been around politics in and out of government for a long time, and I've watched it change. I've watched both parties change. Both parties become more extreme, more strident, less willing to work together with more dangerous extremist ideas coming to the forefront. We can't keep going this way. And elections mean everything. And if we can elect different people, if we can elect independents, third party candidates to shake up the system, we can change American politics. And, you know, electing the first independent member of the Washington State Senate to go as a moderate to Olympia to work with both parties. I think that'd be a step in the right direction and I'd appreciate your vote. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, in ballot order, the candidates for the 31st Legislative District are for Senate, Phil Fortunato, Clifford Kanopic, and Chris Vance. For House Position 1, it's Brandon Bynan, Holly Stanton, and Drew Stokesbury. You should receive your ballot by July 18th and be sure to vote early and no later than August 2nd. Um, I'd like to thank the candidates who participated, the timekeeper, Terry Baker, Tacoma, Pierce County Le League of Women Voters and our community sponsors, the Affordable Housing Consortium, Asia Pacific Cultural Center, Grit City Co-op, Latinx Unidos of South Sound, NAACP of Tacoma, Sumner Waller Community Association, the Tacoma Urban League, Vibrant Schools and the YWCA of Pierce County. You can see other League of Women Voter candidate forums at our website, um, lwbtpc.org. Read your voters pamphlet, look at vote411.org where you can find answers to questions posed to all candidates running for office. Read the candidates' websites and do all that you can to be an educated voter. And don't forget to vote August 2nd. Thank you all and have a great evening. Thank you very much.